Hi everybody. So, sorry for the uh, the delay. We uh, we had a NBN crisis and then um, another little crisis. So um, I'm I'm up live now. Now, if, if people have been trying to get on, I hope you haven't given up because um, I I'm here now. But if you are if you are on board, just message me just to make sure that I know that that, that it's live and and people are, people are uh, are watching it um, because yeah, before we were sort of going blank for a little while. So, yeah, if it's, if it's running live, just just give me the thumbs up or anything like that to let me know people are people are watching. Good, I've just got one come through. Great. So um, anyway, uh, let's let's uh, let's get on board again. Sorry if anyone's got to go to bed early tonight with the late start, but anyway. Um, so the the subject is is following feel. Uh, leading and safe loading. Now we had a, a, a couple of float loading questions that came through, but the one I really liked was safe floating, um, and and I thought that was really good because you know a lot of people talk about in and out of floats, and and then you know, but there's there's, there's a few that sort of go into a little bit more detail about you know how to prepare a horse for a float. Uh, but I'm going to start off with the leading part of it because um, leading is a very underdone tool in horsemanship and, 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 and people who've attended my clinics or lessons um, have probably sort of uh, seen how much emphasis I put on leading and um, how leading and following feel really affects uh, a lot of stuff we do in horses and, and how you know it affects our riding relationship and, 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 and our groundwork relationship. Um, so we often leave horses on their own with a lead rope. So we tie them up to a float or we tie them up to a post and we, we go away and we do something else. And um, and we often see horses that are very stressed and that sort of thing. But but if you spend a bit more time teaching a horse to feel calm with a lead and, and also teach it the true understanding of a lead, then, then, then it's going to be better off, uh, better equipped on its own. Um, and also... Uh, I try and emphasise this to people when I teach them, but uh, and I guess it's through years of training horses for other people, is we're not just training, like oh, some people are going to keep their horse for the rest of their life and they're never going to sell it to anyone else, but, but in often times, you know, I come across horses and I see someone else with them and uh, and horses get sort of bought and sold and that sort of thing and and and, and also you don't know you know if the dentist has got to come the vet's got to come and all these other people the farrier and everyone's got to come around and handle your horse and hang around it and do stuff and um so there, there's a fair bit of time obviously that people spend on the relationship and the quality of, of education that they're putting into their their own horse but there's all there's also a big thing i try and sort of bring to people's mind about you have to prepare a horse for the world um, I say that, but I mean for for, for any anything, uh, you know. So to me, the horse has to understand the the very basics of of the the the, the understanding of pressure and release, um, you know, especially with a halter on and things like that, and and to really understand that it's safe and it can be guided by things like that. Um, so getting into the leading part of it now, I would say following. Feel uh, and leading is so 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 following feel is is basically a horse. You're getting a horse to connect with feel and connect its thoughts to what you're asking it to do. So 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 you're sort of working with its focus really. So if the horse was sort of you know out over here um, and you were over here and you picked up the feel of the the lead, you'd, you'd want a horse to connect back around. Uh, and, and take its focus from over there and, and refocus. Um, so also when you're doing long line work with horses and that sort of thing, obviously on a lunge or something like that, you're trying to get a horse to focus on the circle that it's travelling, whether it be a small circle or a bigger circle, and then you might want it to turn in and change directions and things like that. And the idea is that the, that your leading hand that connects to the feel um, is connecting... To where that horse is thinking and directing it where you want it to go. Also, feel can um, that you put on the lead rope can um, influence the parts of its body. Um, so that's why the horse is choosing to move those parts of their body, opposed to just sort of walking up to the parts and applying pressure, say, to the hindquarter or the shoulders to move away. 
I like to teach a horse to sort of, you know, yield their shoulders through the feel of the feel of an open lead or an open rein. So, um, so obviously it's a rope connected to a, to a, to a halter. But I, I like to encourage people to think that they're they're picking up on a rein every time they pick it up because that you want a, a good connection. It's not just oh, I drag my horse around with the lead and then I get all fancy with the reins. It's like well, you want to be pretty fancy with the lead rope to 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 teach a horse an understanding of the reins. So. Uh, you know, I might want a horse to open up its shoulders, so to do that I'd pick up a, a nice open lead rope and the horse would look through it and, and because the intention of the horse is back around in that direction, it's going to sort of want to reach out with its front inside foot and step across and um, so you know you can teach a horse to do a nice turn on the hind quarter just through the feel of an open lead rope. Um, you can teach them to yield their hips around, around through, an, through, an indirect, um, through an indirect rein and things like that. So that's all very, in, you know, very important in, in body control, especially um, if you don't have to go and, hey, I want your hips, can I just move them over? And uh, can I, I want your shoulders, can I just move them over? If you, if you can connect to a horse's body through the feel of that lead rope, uh, because you, you're connected to that horse's mind, then, then you're gonna have a really soft horse that you know, is moving because it, it feels good about, about what it's doing and, and, it, and it's, its its choice to move. So that's that's one part of you know following feel that can really sort of help help your horses and 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 at clinics I really try and put the emphasis on hey we're not just leading our horses around you know this is more than leading that I'm showing you this is this is the foundation of just about everything you know the soft backups um, how a horse can and do nice flowing transitions you know when it's leading behind you or or even just out out beside you um, and. So, so leading now. Now, when horses get worried, they obviously want to run away from pressure. Um, so, the important thing is is that that um, and 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 the, most of the horses that I, not my, most of the horses I come across, uh, if if I supply worry to them, okay, or they just worry is supplied anyway, because in a lot of environments, a horse just has to look at a horse float and go, oh crikey, I'm out of here. Um, so there's there's worry supplied everywhere, you know, sort of a kangaroo jumps out, anything that 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 supplies worry, uh, and most often times when a horse is worried, what do we do? If we're riding, we pull the reins. If we're on the ground, we we pull on the lead. Okay, and and a lot of worried horses I see, whether it be in the reins or or, or the lead in a, in, a, in a halter, they look a bit like a cat in a trap when they're worried, they're sort of, you know, they're pushing against the, the pressure in their pole or sideways to, to, to sort of get away from the worry and they're not, they're not really comfortable with that pressure and the pressure is not helping them. So um, I think it's very important that we get our horses over all that. So I wouldn't even get a horse near a horse float um, until at least, um, well, if you can. Obviously there's situations where sometimes you've had to take a horse somewhere and things aren't right. but in the perfect environment I'd like to say that well when the horse can lead really well and is really comfortable um, then it's ready to go on a horse float so what does it have to need to know it has to need it need to know that when it pulls back it gives to that pressure but it not only just gives to the pressure it, um, it's happy with the pressure so some horses they, they, they hit the pressure and, and jump forward because they're actually avoiding the pressure. Now some horses feel very light and they trot up very nice, well they seem to trot up very nice but they're just avoiding the pressure and they're actually still worried when they when they, when they actually confront the pressure or the pressure confronts them. Um, so, so for instance if you were to pull the lead and it pulled against the horse, the horse would panic for a moment or br brittle up for a moment. Um, and there's times when they hit the pressure and they, they panic and they're the horses that can pull back and try and pull over through the pressure. So how do we get that, that you know, how do we how do we get a horse to lead? Um, well, we start off by picking up the feel of a, of a lead rein and getting it to sort of, you know, connect through it, look through it, and, and then we might walk off when the horse is connected and put its focus through it, and we'll take them with us, and then we do that either side, so a horse not only, when, when we pick up a lateral bend on a horse, it, what the horse thinks, and then, then uh, you know, puts its effort to moving towards where, where it's thinking. Um, so, so, you know, you do that from side to side. Yeah, a, a question just came up, Rhonda, about horses that rush off. There's a couple of questions, there's a question I've got on board about this when I get to the floating section about horses that run off floats backwards. Um, and, and as I get through the leading, we'll sort of work on how we can, we can work on that. So, um, 
so yeah, we get a horse to think left, think right through the lead, and, and we get them to come along with the lead. So they firstly, um, like I've never come across a horse that can be out there with, it, with the most of its thoughts and bend this way. I see them pretend to bend or try to bend, although some of them do this or some of them do that or they brace a bit, but I've never seen a horse bend nicely and correctly and, 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 and travel correctly uh, to, on a turn when it's got its, its primary thoughts over, over there, okay? So it's always primary focus over there. Um, you know, so that, you know, a lot, a lot of horses get stuck. You know, imagine when you're a horse, um, if you're thinking that way, and the person's over here. I see a lot of horses, that, you know, they're going around on a lunge and the person's standing on this side and the horse is almost going around like this. I, you know, I, I can't, you know, I know you're there, but, but really I'm not paying any attention to it. I, I want to be over there and they're really driven to be out that outside of their brain or, you know, the, the, that, that eye is the window to that side of their brain and that side of their brain is the one that's making the decisions to get through that eye. So, you know, you see these horses running around stiff like that. Well, they really got to learn... To, to come around with the feel of that lead from a baby and follow it and before any energies you know we, we, often people are putting the accelerator jam flat on the horse making it trot around and the horse doesn't even know how to steer so um, you know it's a big gripe I've got is uh, I see people using driving energy but the, the steering wheel's you know broken so I, I try and spend a lot of time fixing the steering wheel getting the horse to follow the feel properly and correctly and then when the horse can understand all that, then you don't have to drive it. You just create a little bit more energy and it can steer anywhere sort of thing. Um, so that lat lateral steering is very important. Uh, and, then, and then we have to get a horse to come along and follow up on the lead. So when a horse pulls back, it knows to come forward and, and sort of stretch out. So, so what I want to encourage a horse to do when I'm leading it is I want a horse to actually not go, oh, there's pole pressure and just... Yeah, you know, go forward like that. I want to, I want to draw it to go. Oh, I want to go that way. Yeah. So, so often times when we've got to go across sort of difficult things, or we want to walk a horse up a float ramp, uh, some horses can shut themselves down to what they. Well, well, it's almost like they block that. What what's in front of them out? They go. I don't want. I don't want to go there. Um, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. And they do that every now and again. You get the curious horses, and they'll come and smash a float and go. What's that? What's that? Sniff, sniff. Um, but the ones that, you know, go like this, they're the tough ones because they, they don't really want to think about where they're going and, and, and they need to because if they get in there and they haven't thought about how they got in there, there's a guarantee that they're going to come out in a big hurry. Um, some still come out in a hurry and they've thought about going in there but they really didn't want to be in there and it's probably through, through humans have, have sort of set up the lesson to go in there but they weren't ready to go in there. So... Leading forward is, is, a, is a very important thing. So I've, I've got a little horse here I'll put out. I hope you can see the horse. This is my little helper. Put him in the middle of the screen. Right. So this is a quiet horse, obviously. It stands very well. Um, so oftentimes we'll be out, out, out here. This is my other little helper. Trying to lead our horse. Okay. Now... There's a lead rope in between the person and the horse. I was, I, I, you've just got to use your imagination. Um, and being good horse trainers, everyone should have a good imagination. So anyway, the horse pulls back, the lead rope gets tight. Okay. Now what a what a you know what a common thing I see quite quickly when the horse is pulled back for a while and holding pressure and it's sort of going like this, holding pressure, heads going back, and this per, the person sort of pulling there. And sort of nothing seems to be happening, and then the horse starts to just sort of roll its eyes back and just sort of shut down in the lead and sit there like this and not do anything. The person sort of either quits on it and lets go, or they go and get their stick or something like that. And then, so what they might do is they try a second go, the person goes, the lead rope gets tight, the horse pulls back, but then the person gets a stick. This is a stick, okay. Now they can put the stick back towards the horse's hindquarter and go bumpity bumpity bump and then the horse goes, oh, come forward, yeah? Now, I try not to teach people that because um, it, it's a very quick way of getting the horse to come forward when the horse pulls back, stick comes along, bumpity bump just up the ribs a bit or up towards the hindquarter area and horse comes forward and then after a while the horse realizes that I pull back and then I come forward. 
Um, it works quite quickly to get a horse trot along behind you. Um, it does, it sort of, you know, quite often that's the way you get horses to trot up on the leader. They pull back a bit, you just get a stick back here and you just give them a little bump bump. Problem is, is um, what I've found, it teaches horses to lead up uh, and, and follow, more so to a cue though, not, not to the connection of feel. Um, but what it does is it teaches the horse to lead, but it doesn't teach them not to pull back. So when a horse is desperate and tied up to a horse float or desperate in someone's hands and really pulls back, it's never thought and, and it's, it's never sort of found an answer while it's been pulling back. It's just had another behind cue come up and go bump bump, yeah? So it's very quick for the horse to go, oh there's pressure behind me because the horse is pulling back, it's thinking back because it's wanting to get back away from the pressure. And then while it's back there, then something comes up from behind and says forward. So it quickly has this, oh, crikey, you've got to get away from that. And that's why the horse comes forward. It works. But is it good in the long run? I would say no, because I believe horses have to search into pressure for a little bit and find an answer. So some people, I, I, I questioned something once and I said, I... I wouldn't get a horse to hook on so so much so that it follows you around like very, very, you know, everywhere you go um, before I taught it to lead. I'd actually keep my horse a little bit at a distance, still friendly and still wanting to follow me and curious, but not, not so much so in a way that it's got to be with me everywhere because I actually like horses to be out here learning to search through the lead, you know, finding an answer, that door's closed, that door's closed, that door's closed until they sort of come along. Whereas if, if they're so sort of intent on following here, as soon as they feel a little pressure, they'll be like, oh, I've got to follow you, okay? But that doesn't help them search in pressure when you're not there. And you have to set up the situation that they've got to search into pressure maybe a thousand times for some horses or a thousand and twenty-one times for others. But if they've done that that many times, then they know exactly what the answer is. And also, they're not worried about pressure. They, they really understand it, and they understand the feel of the, the rain, uh, the, the, the rope. So what I would tend to do, I would get my... Say if I had a stick, and this had a flag or something, or I could just, I could just bang my jeans or something. If I had a horse that pulled back and set its, set its ears back and just wanted to sit on that lead, then I would actually get something out here that worries it because a lot of horses they can shut down to head pressure um, they don't get really f like if you chase a horse you can really worry and get them worried right but if you pull on a horse's head sometimes when they're just used to pulling they go oh yeah right I, I can pull on that and I'll pull and they sort of they shut down and they and when, when they sh I'm, I'm using the term shut down because what, what, I'm, what they're doing is they're um they're not searching anymore. So a horse that's pulling and jumping, it's searching for an answer. A horse that's wriggling around, a horse that's, you know, trying, they're searching, okay? A horse that's just looking around, flicking its ears, they're searching. But the ones that just sort of shut down and just go back like this and sit, they've stopped searching. So instead of bumping them up the, the bottom or behind to make them come forward, you could wave the flag out here. Now what, what happens when you wave the flag out front here? The horse goes, what's that? What's that? And they start pulling again a little bit. But as they're searching, they might jump there or they might come forward. They'll come forward a little bit. And 90% of horses, if you do it right, will um, start to go, oh, oh, I might come forward. You've, all you've done is you've brought their mind back into the land of the living and the land of I, I need to do something. There's, there's something out there I'm not, I'm not sure about. And obviously you're not supplying so much energy that sends your horse off, off the radar. It's just enough, oh, sorry, it's not energy, it's just enough stimulant to make that horse concerned to go, what's that? I can't shut down on that lead anymore because something's happening over there, and I've really got to watch that. And I know, I, I know that that's something you know that that I can't take my mind off that. And that's what takes them out of that shutdown mode. And then they go, oh, oh, there's pressure there, and they'll start reminding, they'll start testing the pressure again, and then they'll come forward. Now, if you do that in your hands, that's a a lot safer than the horse learning it snubbed up to a post or tied to a horse float. Okay, so they might pull back a bit and you might have to, you know, work a little bit at it. But, but when they learn to come forward like that, then, then they're a lot better prepared for tying up and things like that. So that also brings me to the subject of horses when they pull back, and I've, I sort of mentioned it a little bit before, they're worried about going forward. 
because generally they're pulling back and there's something in front of them or the pressure's behind and because and, and the rope's stretched out there and the, you know, the rail's shaking or the float's in front of them or the float's there that they've just ran out of, they're generally pulling back worried about what's in front of them. So what you, you, to me it's sort of senseless to put pressure behind them to worry about something here to jump forward. I would rather teach a horse that if there's something in front of you that worries you, you go towards it. Um, and 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 then and then they'll find that release of pressure, and generally I can sort of soften on the stimulant. So the horse learns that when it's worried and pulled back, it goes forward. That is the only answer. The stimulant, the worry comes from the front. The horse pulls forward. The horse goes. That's better. Okay. So that's that's for horses that learn to shut down and really sort of pull on the lead. But if you're clever and you know your horse is in the educational stages and. Um, you know, you can just give it soft squeezes all the time until the horse just squeezes through and just, just, just comes up softly with you. The other thing is when you catch your horse in the paddock, if you've got half a kilometre to walk up to where you're going to saddle it, don't walk at the same pace the whole way. Stimulate that, come along, slow down, come along, slow down. And the other thing I'd say, um, I'll use my, my little uh, things again, is... Uh, some people, when they want their horse to trot up on a lead or something like that, they might be walking along and then they start tr jogging and then the horse sees the visual cue and goes, oh, I've got to start trotting too, yeah? Because, well, 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 what I would tend to do to make my horse understand it's the feel they're guided by, not the, the, the visual cue, because a lot of, there's a lot of groundwork uh, and, and, um, that I feel people have... The, 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 the visual... Uh, side of horsemanship has 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 um has um sort of degressed or made the, the field part of horsemanship deteriorate because um people have sort of always had a cue to back up feel and the cue's been a visual feel uh, a visual cue and I'll go on to another thing there so so what I would tend to do when I'm leading is instead of me going trotly trotly trot and then the horse goes oh to avoid pressure I watch you trot and then I trot and then we trot together I would go. Pull, pull, pull up the feel, and the horse will go. Oh, here's feel, and then the horse will trot up, and then I go. Hey, let's trot together. Okay, so I would actually use in in the in the learning stages for a long time is use the feel to connect that horse to go trot forward, come forward. Okay, so too much forward, too much forward. Uh, Jill, that that question about too much forward energy, that means the horse is worried about pressure. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's just a horse freaking out in the float and wanting to go over the chest bar. Um, so a horse that jumps forward to pressure, that's not the answer. It's about coming forward softly to pressure and that's, that's why we have to repeat pressure quite a lot of times and we don't, um, that's why I don't chase a horse from behind because it makes the horse jump forward when they, and they realise, oh, I've got to get forward before I get chased or things like that. They've got to learn to search into the pressure and they realise it's a connection. So they're not, they're not releasing, like in, in feel, we're not teaching a horse to release to an empty space. When, we, when we're guiding a horse through feel, we're actually teaching them to be guided by feel, not just sort of go pressure, empty void, pressure, empty void. We're saying, here's the feel and, and, and you're staying connected to it. And, that, and that's how we teach. If we teach like that, the horse won't necessarily... Um, you know, jump to hide from the pressure. So that's part of, you know, leading. When my horse can lead up really softly and I can understand the smile. Now, smile in the lead, if you can understand, this is one end of the lead, this is the other end of the lead. So a big droopy smile that touched the ground like that. So say that was the ground down here, okay? That means the horse would stand still. But if you picked up a little smile like that, okay, uh, and you drew it till it was a sort of tighter smile, so droopy smile to a tighter smile, okay? So when I pick up the weight of that, I want my horse to work on a certain amount of smile. And, and I teach them that, that this much means something, okay? When I droop that, that means, you know, slow down. When I pick it up, it means come along, okay? That's, that's something you can practice, and it works really good. It works also good for when you want to get to a horse to bigger circle on a lunge. Um, so when it comes to loading, okay, we're going to get on to the loading side of it. Um, oh, actually, sorry. One thing before loading... Uh, and as I said before, body language has um, eroded some of the quality feel that, that people might have or, or what they want to have. And I think people have an illusion that their horse is, is following feel 
when it's actually following the cue of the feel and the leading hand, um, and it's the memory of the driving pressure that's actually motivating the horse, not not the feel that's presented to the horse. And and I did I was not really aware of that sort of stuff um, when I was just training horses, but in the last seven years when I started doing clinics, one thing I really saw was horses that were driven by the memory of when the pressure was pushed up to make them worry enough to move away from it. Um, and, 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 and I saw horses that people thought were operating to feel, but the horse's main, the, the horse's focus was still, I'll, I'll use, use this as a demonstration if I can set it up so you can see it. So, say for instance, right, so you see the horse's head and you can see him just there, okay? What I see is I see a person wanting a horse, say for instance, to go out this way, and they put their leading hand out over here for the horse to go like around them like this, yeah? But what I see, the horse going stepping out like this to go out on the circle, but as it's stepping like this, it's looking with quite a strong focus towards the person, moving its shoulders out like that, and then, because it, and, and the inside eye looks a bit concerned, and then when it gets out there, it tends to counter bend anyway. Um, but the reason that's happened is because what's happened is when, when the person put the leading hand out over here, over there, to say to that horse, I want you to look over there, when the horse, they, they sort of went, go out, like leading hand means go over there, and when the horse didn't respond to the leading hand from this side, they would use a waving rope or something like that, and then that would push that horse through like that. Yeah, The waving rope or the flag would push it out and make it go around. Now, it's almost like if the horse doesn't go, I'll add driving pressure. Now the problem with that is years later the horse is still going around, it looks like it's just going out to the leading hand, but I see a horse that still has its primary focus back on where the pressure originally worried it and it's still sort of feeling, looking to me like it's driving out there but not thinking about it and it's not connected to feel, it's connected to the cue of feel. Now cues are, does everyone know baseball? Um, I see a lot of horses that if I was teaching the kid how to play baseball, I know if I was the kid and I'd hit the ball, all I would do was try to get to the next base, and, and, and while I was running to that base, I'd just be running to get to that base. I, be, I wouldn't be connected with anything else, I'd just run as fast as I can to get to that base, otherwise I, I'll get out if I don't get to the base, okay? Now I see a lot of horses respond like that, they're running from cue to cue to cue, and the in-between is like a bit of a void a, a void um, where the horse is disconnected. So a constant a, a thing I see a lot is the horse running around slightly counter bent, horse to the outside, and then suddenly it disengages the hip faces up and goes the other way. Okay, that's a horse that's going from cue to cue to cue. So it's just jumping from post to post to post to 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 you know to the to the baseball um, you know things you know and, and in betweens. It's lost now. If you want a horse to connect with feel, it's a constant dance. It's a connection like a ballroom dance. You're not disconnecting at any time. So instead of the horse queuing out there for the next cue to come in here, and, and, and yeah, I see the leading hand with a rope in it, and I think, well, you may as well cut the rope off because the rope is not talking to your horse. It's just an idea, and your horse may look soft, but it's not connected softly. So there's a lot of discussion in that, and you'd have to probably... Um, you know, it's almost a, another subject in itself, but we're going to get on to, to, to loading. Um, a horse float. Now, don't buy a horse float like this one, because it doesn't have very many windows, so when you park at the lights in Australia, your horses will sweat, and do, would you want to get in that horse float? I don't think so. Okay. So, one suggestion on horse floats, have some windows in them. All the years I've been training horses, um, the the most closed in floats are the ones that uh, the horses go in going, oh crikey, this is a bit like a coffin, I don't like this. The ones with the bigger open windows, more air, more light, they always seem a little bit more comfortable in. Um, so so yeah, so so just get the grinder and cut the sides out of this one if you own one like this. Um, so anyway, we get a horse. Now I always lead my horses in a horse float when I'm leading, uh, when I'm when I'm teaching. Them. I lead them in and 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 I um and I back them out. That's how I do it for a while. And when my horses are 100% comfortable with that, then I will 
look at getting them to go in on their own, but I will not teach a horse to self-load, okay? I will not teach them to self-load as they're learning because I cannot tell them not to go in when I think they're not ready, okay? So some horses will take a step on the ramp and they'll go, oh, I'm gonna go in, and you go, no, you're not ready. And I know when I'm in front of a horse if my horse is ready to go in a float or not. Now, the few questions I've got about horses rushing out the back of a float, well, they're the problems, okay? That's, um, the problem is, is because the horse is not ready to go in, it's been put in and it's gonna rush out. And though you think it's going in, going in is not meaning a horse is going in there, going on comfortable, going in comfortably is when the horse is going in comfortably and um, and that's in your court, not mine, okay? You know your horse and you know if it's going in there and it's not comfortable. Now the hardest thing is, is knowing when you're allowing that horse to take an extra step or not. So I will not allow a horse to go in when it's not ready, okay? Now, most people think, great, my horse is going in because all they're worried about is loading, okay? Now, you should be loading a horse, teaching it to unload, okay? So when I'm loading a horse, I'm not thinking about loading, I'm thinking about unloading, okay? Now, so many horses, they go in and they go straight out the back, okay? Now, there's a reason for that, well, because they weren't ready to go in and they were allowed to go in. That was the first thing. Also, um, they were made hard out here, so, you know, it's hard out here, that's where you seek sanctuary. It's hard out here, that's where you seek sanctuary. It's hard out here, that's where you seek sanctuary. And then the horse goes straight in the float. And then when they get to their destination, the horse goes out of the float, okay? So that's because the float wasn't made easy, the float was, it was made hard out here. So how can you make a float easy? By making it hard out here. You have to go in with your horse and if, if you've worked on leadership, okay? If you've worked on leadership and you've worked on that horse feeling safe through the feel of a rope with you, um, and all those things, then the horse will feel confidence. And if you can teach it to go in there with you, the horse will start to think about the float and understand it, okay? If you don't, the horse has got to go in there on its own. And some people think it's, oh, you know, it's good the horse can think about the float and learn about the float on its own, okay? Hmm. Horses can't even get used to a paddock on their own, okay? So some horses will, 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 will pace a fence for days before they get comfortable. So getting a horse in there on its own is not gonna help, okay? Especially if they can't get used to a paddock on their own. So I'd tip that idea out for a while. Um, and I'd go back to helping your horse learn to go in the float. So that's the start. So if they know how to lead, okay, then basically your horse can go you're, you're, you're standing here somewhere on the ramp here, and you can, you know, first of all, I've made my horse see it with that eye, see it with two eyes, see it with that eye, see it with two eyes, see it. so I know that this side of the brain might go, ooh, and this side might go, ooh, I'm curious, but, but you don't know that until you've led it this way and around the float a few times. So when that horse can look at it with both sides of its brain, two eyes, da 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 da, -da went, so I might just lead it around the float like this for a while until it gets really comfortable, and then what I'll do is I'll just put some feel on the lead and ask it to come forward. And if my horse puts its foot on the ramp, I'll say thank you and I'll just back it off again. And then I'll put a foot on the ramp again and I'll back it off again. And, and say for instance, can everyone see the, the ramp here? Okay, say those little lines on the ramp. What I do is if I find friction just here, then I will work over that friction point, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, until that horse is so comfortable with that first point of friction that it's, it's soft and it's calm. And, else, and, and in between working it backwards and forwards over that point, I will stand it there and I'll stand it there and I'll stand it here and I'll stand it there. And after I've done that, maybe 10 times on one horse, maybe 100 on another horse, depending on the horse, then I might go up to the next spot here and I might find some friction just there. And I go, okay, well, I'm just going to work over that friction point for a while until there's no friction just there. And when I can't feel any friction, what I mean by friction is I ask my horse to come forward and it goes, no, I can't come forward. I'm stuck. So, or I'm a bit brittle there, I'm a bit stuck, or I take a hard step or whatever. Like any time you see a tense step in that horse and that tense or the, or the eyes or the worry, then you will work over that point and stand at that point and work over that point and stand at that point until 
all that tension in that horse in that one point is gone. And then when that tension's gone, you will find another jump, and then another jump. Okay, so it's like teaching a horse to jump. You go over a little jump, you go a little jump, little jump, little jump, and then you're going over big jumps. But you're starting off like this, okay? Now, if you're doing it like that and your horse is comfortable with you, then they're gonna have times where you give it space. Now, that's where well, space means is where you might be standing in the float, uh, you know, up here somewhere inside the float and you've got a big long lead to the horse and the horse is standing out here and or it might be standing here. And then the horse starts to go, oh, oh what's this? You know, stomp, 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 sniff, sniff, stomp, stomp, stomp. You let that happen, um, that's fine. Um, that's great, you want them to test it. Some horses, they haven't tested the ramp, they'll rush the ramp for years, okay? And, and the only reason they're running out of the float is because they're rushing back out over the ramp because they never spent enough time there, okay? So, now when we get to going in, eventually the horse, by the time, if you've done that, you'll get the horse all the way in and all the way out. But doing it like that, you've already taught your horse to back off the float if your horse pulls back, okay? I'm sure there's, quite, there's things about it. What if my horse pulls back? Um, well, if your horse pulls back out of the float, hopefully if you've done this without getting it in the float, it shouldn't pull back. If you've done this right, they shouldn't run back out of the float, okay? Because they're comfortable. But if they come back out, you might teach them how to lead out here, you know, and work on soft, soft leading, okay? Um, and then the horse goes up in here and pulls back a bit. If the horse pulls back out of a float, I won't hold tight pressure there so it doesn't bump its head right there like that. I might just walk out with it and right here I might just firm up the pressure um, or just here and, and I'll let the horse walk backwards holding the pressure until it comes forward and then I'll work on that same take away the resistance, take away the resistance there. Now, obviously that good standing time in between is what the horse needs to soak and relax. And, and while it's standing, I would make the most of walking around the horse. So I'd, I'd come around here and I'd, I'd you know, rub the horse here, I'd walk all the way around here and I'd do that sort of thing. And I'd, I'd, I'd get that all sort of handled and I'd pick up its feet while it's standing there, things like that, just to sort of, you know, show it that, you know, it's just all over and, uh, and then, then get my horse in. So, so for the questions here, and I'll just run through the questions, the, the two uh, you know, really important ones. There's one here. Uh, yeah, I will be listening tonight. Uh, my horse was traumatized by a floating accident, but sub subsequent attempts by so-called professionals to force him on a float with ropes over four months. Hmm. I got him to trust and go back on the float willingly, but as soon as he thinks he is trapped, he panics. When I put the chain across, I thought he might tip the float. It's terrifying. It is terrifying, okay? I've seen horses jump out the back of horse floats and things like that. It is terrifying when a horse freaks out in a horse float and it's, it's, you don't really want to be there. Unfortunately, um, for, for you on that, that question, um, and, and people who have horses, I'm sure there's more people out there that have got horses like that. that, that will take some time. Horses that are badly claustrophobic have had bad instances in floats and if they've had one bad instance, um, you know, and they felt that their life was in danger, then obviously it's gonna be very difficult for those horses to, you know, get comfortable in a float. Um, but, Basically, if you work on the principle that I just showed you of to getting them in, especially if you can make them think forward when you pull on the lead, okay? That's why I don't put driving pressure from behind because I want a horse, if I say pull forward, it goes, oh, can I really think over there and, and test that ramp? Is that okay? Okay, so the worry is in front of them. They become curious of the worry, and that's why I always stimulate a horse um, with, a, with, you know, if I was going to worry them to make them search, like with a little bit of a flag or a stimulant, and the worries in front because they learn to search in front, become curious of the worry, but the curiosity came through the feel of the lead, okay? So if you're teaching a horse correctly to lead, then, then it'll learn to um, think forward, test things and test things, and, 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 and you might spend a fair bit of the time with the horse on the ramp, just testing the ramp, sniffing it, sniffing here, sniffing there. Sometimes they do that, they, they test the sides of it, they sniff the sides and things like that. Um, you might spend a fair bit of time with your horse doing that, 
and just backing it off. And, and if you went like this, a lot of times, I mean a lot of times, I mean don't load your horse and unload it, this one, a lot of times stop. And, and, and sometimes when I'm talking to people and teaching them, I'm saying backwards means forwards, backwards means forwards, because every time a horse pulls back, what's going to happen? Pole pressure, that's a guarantee if they're tied up, pole pressure's going to come off. So I teach the horse that 50,000 times if I have to, backwards means forwards, backwards means forwards, backwards means forwards, until, uh, and, and, and remember, it's not just a yo-yo yeah, yeah, all the time, you've got that stop time, that stop time when the horse relaxes, when you see that release of tension and things like that, that the horse searches in the float and then eventually it leads in. Um, but you've done that all the way in, so it's going like this until it's all the way in, okay? And when you back it out, you back it out like this. You never ever unload a horse by backing it straight off. Um, as, well, you do, most people do, but if you've taught a horse how to load, especially a traumatised one, uh, especially a baby who's never loaded before and, and only just starting to load and do things, and the first you know, heaps of unloads, you always stop it, connect it, walk it forward, stop it, connect it, walk it forward, stop it, connect it, walk it forward. Um, and, and it might take you a couple more seconds to unload than someone else, but your horse will always be connected to you. So basically what will happen is, you take the float away, throw it away, because basically the float's invisible, and that's how we've sort of loaded our float. It's an invisible float, and we've just connected our horse into it and out of it, and it doesn't really matter. This was just an object. Um, the connection was where the education started. Obviously, they still will look at the float, though, so it still will be visible, but you sort of imagine the quality of leading in the respect that the float's not even there. Um, so... The other thing that's highly important for safe travelling and things like that, you know horses that scramble? So sometimes scrambling happens, I hope I can do this with my little demo horse, is, is this is what's happening, I hope you can see now, I'm going to put my demo horse in, okay? Now the horse is standing in the float travelling, okay? Now we go around a corner, and we're, we're rough drivers you see, now the horse um, He's never touched the sides before, and maybe he goes, well, I can't touch the sides, I don't know what they're like, I'm scared. I came in here scared, and I'm still scared, and maybe the horse would never have been a scrambler, but we don't know, because once it started to scramble, then the habit seemed to sort of persist, but maybe we were driving along, and the horse was in the float, and then we went over a bump, and it lost its balance enough to touch the side, and then, oh no, oops, I've lost my scrambler. So, because that horse was too scared to touch either side of the float, it panicked and freaked out, okay? It didn't want to touch the sides, but it overbalanced a bit and got all worried and then scrambled, okay? So, maybe what we should do when we load our horses and, and, um, is we get them in the float, now, before I've loaded a horse, this is another thing, especially for the one that, that you said you're worried about, the uh, chain pressure. I teach horses, um, once I've handled them all over, around the rump, up under the tail, things like that, I just put a butt rope around them, and I teach them how to back up into butt rope pressure. Now, I don't load them with a butt rope, um, but I teach them that they can back into pressure, and it's not going to be frightening. And what I sometimes do is I... Is I as I pull the butt rope and pull the lead at the same time so they feel like a bridging bar. So I, I teach a horse about the bridging bar before I, I, I put them in the float so that it's, they feel bridging pressure, they feel bridging pressure, they don't kick, they don't worry, they don't, things like that. Don't go and butt rope your horses if, you've, if they're sort of never been touched around there because um, you can cause yourself problems. Uh, and don't use a butt rope to lead your horse in because it's putting the thoughts back on the butt rope to make a horse go in, whereas I want the horse to lead forward in through the pole pressure. So the butt rope's only there to get a horse used to the pressure here when it pushes on the breaching bars, okay? So once a horse can back up and softly come forward, not jump forward, softly just take its weight off or weight it and, and teach a horse. So I teach a horse to back into the, the, the butt pressure also. So I teach them to back into that butt rope and go, eh, and sort of lean on it and lean on it. And then and, and that's okay. And then, once they're understanding that, 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 that breaching pressure, so I'm doing this on a straight load float, not an angle float, because angle floats, um, if, you can, if you can lead them in and out of a straight load float, you can put them in and out of an angle float pretty easy. Um, there is one question here about closing an air horse in, but um, I'll get to that. Um, so once the horse has gone in the float, okay, 
all the way in. Right, we've got the divider beside it, and we put the breaching bar up in here. I back the horse to the breaching bar, I walk it to the chest bar, I make it touch the chest bar, I make it push against the chest bar, and because I've got it leading well, I can make it push the chest bar. Breaching bar, chest bar, breaching bar, chest bar, breaching bar, chest bar, to the horse line. I can touch that, I can touch that. Then I walk in beside the horse, and I'll just stand here, and I'll just push my horse like this. So this is the sides of the float, yeah? I push my horse into that, and then I just gently, by the wither, I just put my weight on my horse and rock it like that, and I rock it till it touches this side, and that side, and this side, and then I back it up to the breaching bar, back it up to the chest bar, back it up to the breaching bar, push it from side to side. Now, oops. Now, what'll happen there is you're teaching the horse that it can touch the sides of the float, it can rib up against them, it can touch them, you know, forward, back. That prepares them for, for some of the, the things that are travelling, so all it has to get used to then is the movement. Uh, but then if it knows, it can touch the whole inside of the float, and, it can't, and it's not there to hurt it, and it's all there to support it and help it, and the rope's there, if the horse backs up, it'll come forward, and then everything will be fine. As the other thing too is if... The hardest thing is with ponies, it's dangerous with ponies because you've got this, you know, it's good that the breaching, the horse can touch the breaching bar and not pull back and then have all this gap, like this big gap between its, 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 its butt and the breaching bar. So if you're travelling with ponies and stuff, it's much better that you design a float that you can actually put the breaching bar up further, up, 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 so, so the horse is fitting fairly snugly between the chest bar and the breaching bar, so if it did pull back, by the time the rope pressure may be pulled on it, it's sitting on that on that butt bar there, okay. And also, like I I, I like the butt bars. They've got a bit of padding on them, so because I have seen some horses with bad rubs on their tails, from from um, you know having a chain or or, or a ramp that's pretty rough that they're leaning against. Because some horses will lean, you can't stop it, you know. But if you've done all that, then they're they're used to being in that confined space and inside the float. Um, so one of the, the, the questions here was, the lady's got a horse that he loads and unloads easy. Getting him to stay there is the trickiest part. Now, if you've done what I've said, is get your horse so accustomed that there's no lumps and no, 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 no tricky bits, no bits where the horse tenses as it's walking out, and he can go one step at a time, softly, then your horse will be a lot more relaxed in there, okay? And, 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 and as you're doing it in stages, like this stage here, you might have walked all the way around your horse, and this stage here, you might have walked all the way around your horse, and then, and then the next stage, and then you might walk all the way around your horse. Um, now the backup, when it, which I didn't mention before, is the quality leading, you've got to have a quality backup, okay? If you don't have a good backup, don't put a horse on a float, okay? Because if your horse is going to go push, push, and then jump, then all the good work you're putting and stepping it up. So basically, I cannot load a... Well, the way I do it, I can't load a horse if it can't back up because I have to go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards because it's 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 really um, not a good idea to load a horse that doesn't back up because then you now I've had a lot of horses dropped off to me in the float and they won't move their feet once they've got somewhere. But also, yeah, you have to be able to back them softly so you can stand them at every stage, okay? Um, Rhonda, once you have your horse going forward and back, yes, okay, the next stage, okay? The next stage will be when is it, when is it right to put your horse in the float um, on its own? Well, when you've done all that and your horse is really confident in the float, then you can send it in on its own and it'll go, well, I'm confident in here, I don't need you, I don't need the sort of wet nurse around anymore because you've made me believe that this thing is okay. So you've done your job, okay? You've made that horse show that the float is easy. You've not just made it hard out here and to go in there, you've realised that the that the float is a, is a good place and it's an easy place to be and, and the horse has got confidence once you're at that stage, okay? You can, you can teach your horse just to step in. So if the horse knows how to follow feel, which if you've loaded the horse that well, it, it should know how to follow feel. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is the importance of getting a horse. Um, so say, say, for instance, your bubble is your arm's distance, okay, your, your personal bubble, okay. Now, 
a lot of people when they send a horse out on the circle, they sometimes have a separate foot supply driving energy and the horse goes zoop out over here. But what's really, really important for a lot of horses, um, and, and it's also good for you guys to sort of do it, because some horses they actually, they don't like going this way because they always want to keep that eye on the person and they go, oh, I don't want to do that because I want to keep that eye on you, okay? Some of the other way, okay? So it's really important to get a horse to walk past you like that, walk past you like that. Enough that your outstretched arm is out here and it can just walk past your bubble like that and feel great about it. And this side, it's got to do the same thing. It's got to feel great about it too on that side. Uh, this horse is a bit counter-bent, but that's just the way they moulded this one. Like a lot of horses that I see have moulded in one side. <laughs> uh, so it goes this way and feels good. Now, if the horse can do this and this, then there's no reason why that's just at the ready stage to, to just go past you in the float and you just, just, just gently send it in. Uh, you might walk up the divider with it for a bit until it can walk further and further on its own and uh, let, it, let it go in on its own. Uh, Travelling with the horse tied up. <laughs> Don't ask me tough questions like that. Um, the reason I say it's, it's, it's one of these questions. What's the lesser of evil? Okay. Yep, and there's a good will. I missed a question. Sorry, I'm just reading a question. Will this help with the one that double barrels the tailgate when travelling as well? I think so. I think because in my experience with horses, confidence does a world for horses, okay? When you've got a horse that has anxiety running through it, it has all these other things that happen in its mind, and I've seen horses that are confident, things change, and, and you don't have to teach a horse everything. Suddenly things just happen, okay? So I'd like to think that confidence and trust uh, in that horse would help it. Um, and, and obviously it, it's not feeling good in there and it feels sort of threatened, so it's obviously you know responding with threatening behaviour. So that maybe that's why it's maybe that's why it's kicking at the tailgate. I can't really sort of. Um, and Kay, your your one about the horse travelling free or tied up. Well, this is a, this is an interesting one because um, some people don't tie their horse up because they think it's dangerous if it gets hung up, tied up. Well, um, this is what happens in a horse float. Some horses have a panic and they go up in the front and then their back slips because after a while weighing in the float with a bit of manure and that sort of thing, their back feet slip out and pop like that. So that has happened in floats before where the horse has done a back flip like that. If something happens in a horse float, I think either way they're going to end up smashed up if they're tied up or not. I think... Um, um, so tied up, I like to think if I had a horse tied up, I'd definitely have it hard tied because, and, and you know what, they build floats with these sides that have got puffy bits for their ribs, but you know what, there's nothing there for their heads, like, you know, they've got this mesh thing on this side and they've got something on this side, and, and all the injuries I've seen on horses where horses have gone bang, 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 like that, and they've got smashed up eyes and things like that where they pull back and bash their heads, okay? But then the other ones were the worst stages where they've jumped over dividers, they've flipped upside down and things like that, and they've got caught underneath dividers. So, yeah, it's sort of like it's either way, it's going to be dangerous, whatever happens. If they're, if they're sort of tied up and they can touch the breaching bar and they can't get up, okay, chances are they might pull back and come down, okay? If you've done your homework, it's going to be a lot better. If they freak out and they're not tied up, then they could end up, anywhere okay so that's that's you know something you got to think about i have seen people and i no, i've not done it so i could not recommend it put it put a big um strap just over their shoulders if they go to jump it just touches across their wither and stops that 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 you know that that could be a, a, a thing but uh that, that that might help but yeah i tend to time uh have a good thick holder like you know ideally you'd want a thick holder uh especially in the little thick holder that's around the nose and around the pole. Uh, yeah, and if you want to be safe with your horse, if they pull back, get a couple of old pillows and <laughs> put, them, put them on the sides where they're going to hurt themselves. Because, um, yeah, their ribs are a lot stronger than their, their head. Ah, oh, well, their head's strong, but, yeah, their, their eyes aren't so strong. Um, yeah, but, uh, I mean, there's so much more things that I can go into, but, yeah, the horse that gets quite forceful and you need someone else to hold the divider and tries to push out... I'd say it's still not comfortable in there and you've got to work on that comfortable. And as I say, if they're trying to rush past to get in there past you, 
they're doing it because they're not confident and there's something going on. They're either worried about pressure, you, you know, through the lessons that pressure's been a thing that makes them worry, um, and they're going in the float. Um, and another thing too, I just want to say about the self-loading. Uh, you self-load after the, as I said before, you self-load after the horse is led in, led it, led in the float. And the other thing is, um, just be careful. I see is some people when they're putting a lot of effort outside here to make their horse uncomfortable. Okay, and their focus has been uncomfortable, and the horse finds the ramp, and they show that's a comfortable spot, and that's a comfortable spot. And eventually, the horse goes in. I see some horses they go in too fast, but what's um, also happening is while you're making it uncomfortable out here, what I was talking about confidence in the la in the first um, the first talk we did confidence confidence in you and your leadership. Okay, that's the biggest thing. One of the biggest things that you're going to have all through your life with your horse for, for, for whatever you're doing, okay? If you're teaching a horse, if you're making it hard out here and only rewarding the hard when the horse gets close to the float, then, then to that horse, to me, it's, it's making the horse seek refuge in, a, in an undesirable place away from you and your education, okay? So just be careful you're not sort of supplying that information to your horse because over time, uh, it might be fancy for that lesson or you might get your horse in but, but I don't think it's going to help in the long term scheme of things so just be careful if you're in any situations if you're the one that's making it hard and then the horse has got to get away from you to get a release from that hard chances are that, um, that the relationship will erode a little bit anyway, thanks for tuning in everybody um, I'm going to be down at the Hunter Valley this weekend for a clinic so if anyone's down the Hunter Valley that's a bit confused about all the muddle that I've put you in then then come and come and uh, have a have a look. But uh, next week, uh, Wednesday night again, uh, if the internet holds up, we'll be on again, and um, I'll see you then. We'll email a subject. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll post the subject. Um, uh, you know, a couple of days beforehand of what we're going to talk about. Thank you. Bye.